أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولما جاءهم كتاب من عند الله مصدق لما معهم وكانوا من قبل يستفتحون على الذين كفروا فلما جاءهم ما عرفوا كفروا به فلعنة الله على الكافرين اللهم سبحانه Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam, respected brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our series has been discussing the awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farja sharif in the Holy Qur'an. And we have looked at this verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 89, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Jewish community of Medina, whereby they were preparing themselves for the coming of their Savior, meaning the Holy Prophet of Islam. And when he came, ma arafu kafaru bih, they did not recognize him. They did not have ma'rifa and cognizance of him. And as such, the outcome was they belied him and they rejected him. And so the lesson for you and I is that we must obtain a deeper cognizance of the Imam of our time to ensure that we do not fall into the same trap as the Jewish community of Medina. And so these first three nights of our discussion has been looking at various aspects in order to gain cognizance of the Imam of our time. The first night we looked at him at a personal level and tried to understand his personality and how such a great individual would as per his grandfather's examples, would even love and care and cry on behalf of his enemies to the extent that on the 10th of Muharram, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam asked his killers not to kill him because he wished not to see them in the pitfalls of hell. And then the second night, we looked at the concept of the Imam in terms of a global concept and that the Imam of our time must be seen as the Imam of all of humanity, not just the Shia and not just the Muslims. He is an Imam for those individuals in Peru and in Bolivia and in New Zealand and Alaska and North Korea as much as he is an Imam for you and I. And so we must interpret him as such. We must see him in light of modern issues we must see him in light of a global context and everything that comes with that. And last night, we moved the concept of Ma'rifah forward to try to pose some questions as to how the Imam's policy would be. And so, if you see that the way in which the Prophet came and how he dealt with the troubles of his time, the various aspects of society, such as the tribulations that came to women, or slaves, or the black community, it is not the same today. The same challenges that were posed to Rasulullah 1400 years ago are not necessarily the same challenges that the awaited Savior of humanity would have today. And so, we have to ask ourselves, what would be the Imam's policy? How would he instruct the United Nations? How would he utilize NATO? How would it be when he comes to the challenges of culture? When he looks at a country like Iran, or Pakistan, or Peru, or Canada, each of these countries are different in themselves. And just like 
a father who has two children, both of them are unique, neither of them can be brought up in the same way. They have their own stresses, they have their own environment, they have their own period of time that they live in. And so it would be impossible for us to expect that the awaited Saviour would treat the whole world exactly the same. He must look at this world through the uniqueness of what it is. And so, when you look at these cultures and you see the dividing lines of humanity, we will say that some are very nationalistic and so he must deal with the community in order to break and to mold them in accordance with their own circumstance. Some communities have very broad cultures that reach to other parts of the world. And so the Imam must deal with these modern day challenges. And so if we understand this, we will be very astutely aware that the Imam must play a role in terms of politics, economics, military, education, and all of this will permeate into our ma'rifa of the Imam of our time, Imam al-Mahdi, ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al-Sharif. And so we concluded yesterday by saying that we're going to look over these next four or five nights at various discussions. We want to ask, what does the Imam do in his ghaybah? We want to understand what is the theology of ghaybah? What is the philosophy of ghaybah? How does this impact the world's preparation for the Imam? And so tonight our discussion is, how or rather what does the Imam do during his ghaybah? Because when we talk of ma'rifa and having cognizance of the Imam of our time, surely this must be a very important and primary question for us. You see, because we spoke about not limiting the Imam, we spoke about the interpretations and how we cannot base the Imam upon our petty and limited contextualization. We cannot view him in light of the Khoja world. We cannot view him only in light of the Shia world. We have to see him as a universal Imam. And so, when it comes to technology, when it comes to industry, when it comes to economics, we must see the Imam in that light. As such, we have been molded to consider the Imam's ghaybah in a very limited context. On a Tuesday night, he goes from one masjid to another. And so he will go from Masjid Sahla and he will go to Masjid Jamkaran. And on such and such a night, he will perform the ziyarah and he will go from one maqam to another. And on a Thursday night, he receives our book of deeds. And when we recite, Ya Imam al-Zaman, Adarikna, Adarikna, help us, help us, As-Sa'a, As-Sa'a, this hour, now, now, he comes to our aid. I agree. But is that all he does? Have we limited our concept of the Imam to just this? If the Imam is truly the Imam of the whole world, Whereas only 300 million Shia consider him alive out of 7 billion people, does he have no connection with 6.7 billion people around the world? Does he have nothing to do with them whatsoever? What does the Imam do? What relevance does he have with the world today if I'm going to box him in to sitting on his musalla the whole day? to just coming to the aid of the Shia whenever we cry out, from going from one ziyara to another. Is that all he does? And so, we have to broaden our concept and understand the Imam in light of the other Imams. Understand him in light of his role for ghaybah and his own mission. You see, we are very astutely aware of certain suppositions, but sometimes we fail to bring them to the Imam of our time. We often notice that each Imam developed Islam in, from its cradle to its maturity 
in light of its own era. For example, can we say that the stresses, the challenges, the environment of the first Imam is the same as the fourth Imam, same as the sixth Imam? Or do we find that each one of those Imams gave us something relative in accordance with the eras that they lived in? For example, when we talk about our fourth Imam, Zayn al Abidin, salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi, we normally talk about how he gave to us three specific things relative to Islam, relative to his own period of time. He gave to us Risalat al Hukuk, he gave to us Sahif al Sajjadiyya, and he gave to us the institution of Azadari. The fact is that because his environment required as such, because he was able to develop Islam within its cradle of that era to the maturity of its era, he could provide us those three particular movements. It's not that the other Imams didn't know them. It's not that the other Imams didn't have access to them. But our community as a Muslim community and the environmental factors outside of it enabled him to be able to present that to us at that time. Our maturity allowed us to welcome it. The same incident comes at the sixth Imam's time, Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so we find that in his time, he gave to us many ad'iyya, supplications, many ziyarat. He spoke to us at length, at length about the third Imam, about the Imam of our time. We find that he was a teacher of thousands of students. Was it that the fourth Imam was unaware of those ziyarat? Was it that the fourth Imam didn't know those theologies or those philosophies? No. As Islam expanded, as new people entered into the fold, as it gained new challenges, as that era advanced from one to another, the sixth Imam could present a different side of Islam. He could accommodate for the greater expression of Islam that was at that time. And so, the Imam of our time must be doing the same. For example, when technology comes, he cannot ignore this technology. When a new industry comes, when a new challenge comes, he cannot ignore it. He must see his global movement in light of these modern eras and challenges. Let me give you an example. We have the hadith from our fifth Imam Muhammad Baqir sallallahu alayhi wa that says that when the Imam comes, he will place his hand upon our heads. This context is after his establishment of a global system, after he removes injustice. He will place his hand upon our heads, humanity's heads, and bring them to the fore of their completion. He will make us use the entirety of our intellect. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? For a number of reasons. The first one is that we find that when we see narrations like this, too often enough, we try to interpret it in a very mystical way magical way. You see those narrations that would say, the sixth Imam salam, is narrated to have said, at the end of time, a person will look into the palm of his hand and he will see a person from the other side of the world. A person from the east will see a person from the west. A person from the west will see a person from the east. Now, 1400 years ago, if you lived in the Bedouin-esque society, of the Arab community and the sixth Imam's time, how do you think they would have interpreted this narration? They would have been bewildered. In fact, it probably would have been so miraculous they could never have conceived of it. However, today, when you and I open our iPhones and we Skype or we FaceTime a person from our family on the other side of the world, it is not such a shock. We say, my God, the sixth Imam 
predicted this. It wasn't a miracle, it just took someone from China to be able to realize this was a technological advancement. Whilst we Muslims sat and did our tasbihat, another person went and achieved what the sixth Imam was talking about. Whilst we were still very petty in arguing whether there's one moon or three moons, whether we should have mandazi and barazi in our iftar, the Chinese man went to go and perform the miracle that the sixth Imam was talking about. This is what we are talking about. The reality of the world that we live in. And so when the fifth Imam says that he will place his hand upon the head of the people of the world and he will bring us to the fore of our completion, we can interpret this narration by saying, MashaAllah, what a wonderful miracle the Imam will complete. Right now, it's very interesting. Hollywood keep producing these films that are talking about the completion of humans' intellect. Correct? They have that film Limitless, and they have this new one called Lucy that is out. They are trying to figure it out. They are postulating what would it be if humanity arrived at the fore of its completion. Instead of using just 5% of our brains, or 10% of our brains, what would happen if we use 20% or 50% or 100%? Technology is actually trying to achieve this today. You can go and read this, but there are nanochips, not microchips, nanochips, that the scientists are trying in the next 10 years through surgical operations to implant into our brains. How much information is on a nanochip? The reality is, it's not just encyclopedias, it's Google. You know when you type into Google, you have a question, and it says, 3.7 million articles have come up in 0 0.5 seconds. That is what is on the nanochip. The scientists of today, within 10 years, that they will have placed microchips, nanochips into the brain so that the brain can download all of that information of whatever it needs. It needs to learn a new language, it's there. It needs to learn how to ride a motorbike, it's there. You need to learn how to fly a plane, it's there. And so when the Imam comes, he lives in a very modern world. I cannot continue to interpret him in light of camels. I cannot continue to interpret him in light of the petty world that I want to create. I have to understand him in light of the world that is. On one hand, on one hand, there is Sudan that has 1.1 million refugees. And on the other hand, in California and in the institutes of California, they are building nanochips to place into the brains of human beings. When Mahdi sallallahu alayhi comes, he must deal. He must deal with both ends of the spectrum. He must remove global poverty, and he must utilize humanity and bring them to the fore of his completion. What is he doing in his ghaiba? Is he only sitting on his musalla? Is he going from maqam to maqam to maqam waiting for us to say, Ya Mahdi adrikna? Or is he engaging in this world just as each imam engaged in this world? And so the ma'rifah requires us to consider this. Each imam provides us with that spectrum. But there is a narration which comes to us from our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa that we must use very well for the coming nights. And this narration I request everybody to try to memorize and ponder upon as we think about our suppositions. The narration says, Al-Mahdi yasna'u kama san'a Rasulullah. Al-Mahdi acts just as Rasulullah has acted. Meaning that the principles Rasulullah uses 
we can use as the archetype to understand how the Imam of our time works. Let us look at how the Imams were and try to understand the Imam of our time. There is a book translated into English, we have mentioned it on the first nights, called The Message by Ayatollah Ja'far Subhani. May Allah grant him a long life. You can read this on al-islam.org, The Message by Ja'far Subhani. In this book, he postulates a question. He says, for years before Rasulullah announced his Risala, before he announced his messengership, Rasulullah would ascend daily to Ghar Hira. What was he doing up there? Have we ever thought about this? Was Rasulullah just sitting there doing tasbihat? Was he just sitting there doing prayers the whole day? Is this what an Imam does? Quran says, Rasulullah states, Ana basharum mithlakum. I am a human being like yourselves. He says, Huwa yamshi fil aswaq wa ta'am. He walks through the markets like you do. He eats like you do. There is a part of him that is divinity. He is nur. At another stage, he is human like you and I. We have to understand him in light of humanity. Otherwise, there's no point in having an imam. God may as well have sent robots to you and I. I have to understand the imam in light of humanity. And so what was Rasulullah doing? Ayatollah Ja'far Subhani says in his book, he says two things. The first thing is he was pondering upon the universe. He calls this the book of existence, meaning he was looking at how existence is. He was trying to understand all of the natural stresses, all of these natural environments. He wanted to understand the relationship between everything within existence, one another. The second thing he was pondering upon, and this is key, he was pondering upon his own community. Rasulullah, you see, if you've been to Ghar Hira, may Allah take us all, inshaAllah, it is a mountain that overlooks Mecca. Yes, if you've walked up, you can actually see Masjid Haram. You can actually see and imagine that Rasulullah was looking down upon his community and seeing the way that they interacted with each other. For years and years, decades, Rasulullah would ascend and descend, ascend and descend, and he would watch and observe his community. To what end? To what goal? For the purpose of knowing and understanding how to develop them, how to get the best out of them. He would understand their strengths and he would understand their weaknesses. He would understand the things that they are failing at and the things that they are succeeding at. He would understand that if I deal with this community and this individual, I know that he will react in such a way and she will react in such a way. And I know that this community require first and foremost to be changed in these ways. And so he could create for himself a plan of how he would deal with his community in the 23 years that he had to change them. Now that's very interesting because someone will challenge and they will say, but he doesn't need to do any of that. He's a prophet. It's all there in his mind. It's just that God needs to tell him what to do. And then Rasulullah would flick his fingers and everybody would become Muslim. No, no. This is the most ridiculous notion. Rasulullah was a human being and he came to human beings. They were like you and I. They had their likes and their dislikes. If you spoke to them in a certain way, they would react in a certain way. If you were to call them in a certain way, they would respond in a certain way. And so this is not a magical story. This is not Hollywood. This is not fables. This is not cartoons. This is real life. Rasulullah had to deal with real people the way that they would normally react, the way the elite would react, 
the way the rich would react, the way the stubborn would react, the way women would react, the way children would react. In the same way, Mahdi alayhi, observes his world today and he looks at it and he ponders constantly as to how best to illuminate the hearts. How, if I was to come, would I best deal with New York and their culture and dynamic? If I was to come to Peru and Mexico, how would I deal with them? If I was to come to Pakistan with their circumstance, their culture, their ethos, their TV, their economy, their politics, their likes, their dislikes, how would I change Pakistan to being a community that is entirely submissive to God? The same way the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib used to act. You know what he would say in Nahj al He wrote to his son, the second Imam, in letter number 31. He says, I have walked amongst the ruins of history and I have pondered upon the way in which they lived to the extent that it's as if I used to live with them. I used to ponder upon Nuh and upon Hud and Saleh and Shu'ib Salam Allahi alayhim ajma'een and I used to ponder upon the people of Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun La'anatullahi alayhim ajma'een to the extent that it's as if I walked with them hand in hand. I understood them and so I would know how to deal with them. This is the same way. Our Imam is very rational. He understands things in the way in which the world is today. And so he will develop the world in light of the world that he sees today. Imagine the third Imam. The third Imam, he would send his ambassador, Muslim ibn Aqil. Why did he send him? Because he would receive 600 letters a day inviting him from around the whole Muslim Ummah. And when Muslim ibn Aqil arrived in Kufa, he wrote a letter and said, I have 18,000 swords with you. And so as a rational human being, the Imam saw, I know I have been called. My ambassador says I have an army with me. If I topple Kufa and bring Kufa, I can topple Damascus and Yazid. Logic says I go towards this place. It's not because I have been predicted to go. It is not because it's divinely written that I go. I make a rational judgment and this is why I go towards Kufa. In the same way, our Imam is exactly the same. He looks at this world. He understands our community and how to deal with our community. He understands Cambodia. He understands North Africa. He understands this world. And so we have to see him in light of the world that we live in. We will continue this tomorrow in more depth. But think about these things. When we talk about the Imam of our time, we have to demystify him from being this abstract notion that he's very hard to believe in, to understanding the Imam is the Imam of our time and that he engages in the world the way you and I engage in this world. And so his standards are the standards of the Imam. His thought process is pure like the thought process of each Imam. Whose example does he have to take? Tonight, we imagine he is in Najaf. Or he is going to frequent between Najaf and Kufa. And as the time of Salat al-Fajr comes, he will stand behind the place in which his grandfather was struck on his forehead. An Imam of such caliber that when he was leaving his house, he turns towards his daughter, Umm Kulthum, salamullahi alayha, and says, O oh, Umm Kulthum, these animals that we have, 
If after my death you cannot afford to feed them, then please set them free, for they should not be mistreated. As such, God is, the look, is looking after their rizq. And so if you let them free, they will find their food. This is the inspiration of the Imam. Or when Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, entered into Masjid Kufa, he found his killer, his killer waking, he found his killer asleep. What did he do? He sat beside him and he shook him to wake him up and said to him, it is Salah time, wake up. He woke his killer up for salah in the hope that this individual would better himself by remembering God. As he walked away from Ibn Muljim, he said to him, he turned in a line of poetry and said, he wishes death upon me whilst I wish life for him. This is the kind of inspiration that the Imam of our time takes. The narration says, on this night, as he broke his iftar, his daughter came and gave to him three pieces to break his iftar with. So hungry Ali ibn Abi Talib was, but she offered to him some salt, some bread and some milk. Amir al-Mu'mineen turns towards his daughter and says, Oh my dear daughter, when have you seen your father eat three things for iftar? Take one of them away. Imagine right now, Mahdi sallallahu alayhi must see the people in Palestine without water, without electricity, people who are without fathers and mothers and brothers to protect them. Ya Mahdi, your grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib could not sleep and eat knowing they were hungry and poor people around the world. Imagine what your grandson Mahdi sallallahu alayhi is feeling like tonight. And so, as he finishes this tiny iftar, he walks out of his house and into his house. Out of his house and into his house. And he looks up at the sky and says, By Allah, this is the night decreed for Ali ibn Abi Talib. His daughter says, Oh father, what are you saying? I have not heard these kinds of words from you. He says, This is the night in which my brother had predicted that your father would be struck. And so she runs towards him and says, Father, do not say such words. How can we bear without you? He says to her, do not cry, my daughter. This is the night that has been predicted. It comes to the morning time and Ali ibn Abi Talib leaves for his nawafil prayers. He exits and enters into that masjid. He wakes up Ibn Muljim and then he starts his prayer. At this moment, Ibn Muljim stands beside him. And as Ali ibn Abi Talib enters into his ruku' and then enters into his sajda, this man takes out his sword and strikes the blessed head of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib falls out of his prayer and says, Fustu Rabbil Kaaba, my sword where by the Lord of the Kaaba I have been successful, I have longed for martyrdom and now I have achieved it finally. At this moment, Jibra'il descends from the heavens and cries out, لَقَدَّ هَدَّمَتْ أَرْكَانَ الْهُدَى وَانْفَصَمَتِ الْعَلْوَةُ الْوُثْقَى قُتِلَ بْنُ عَلِيٍ الْمُرْتَضَى he cries out, surely now the pillars of guidance have been struck down. Ali ibn Abi Talib has been struck. The narrations say that in the area of Masjid Kufa, it was the same as Karbala. Meaning that the whole area shook like an earthquake. Meaning that there was blood running underneath the stones. At this point, Lady Umm Kulthum is narrated to have said that she runs out and she finds the captured Ibn Muljim. Ibn Muljim has been captured at this point. Before even Amir al-Mu'mineen comes to him, Umm Kulthum comes to him and says, Oh Ibn Muljim, I swear to God, you have done no harm to my father. He responds by saying, No, this is not the case. I had doused 
this sword in so much poison that if I were to strike a thousand people of Kufa, one after the other, after the other, there would still be poison upon this sword to dispatch all of them. That is the amount of poison that is running through your father's head at the moment. Ali ibn Abi Talib calls Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam and says to him, Hassan, you lead Salat al-Fajr. I will pray this Fajr in a sitting position. We say to you, oh, Ali, if you are praying your Fajr in a sitting position, Remember Sayyidah Zainab, your daughter, who will also be reciting in a sitting position just 50 years later from now. Because Zayd al Abidin will come to her and say, Ammata, oh my auntie, why are you praying your prayer sitting down? Limada, to Salina Salat al Layl an Jalusan. Why are you praying your Salat al Layl in a sitting position? She will respond, Inna ma rukbatai. Oh my, oh my dear nephew Zain al Abidin, my knees are too weak for me to even stand up on this night of Shah Maghriba. Ala la'anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-dhalimeen wa sayalamu al-lazheena al-dhalamu ayyumun qalabiyan qalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the awaited Savior, to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. And to perform the ziyara of Amir al Mu'mineen. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Matima Ali, ya Ali.